Oh, hey, don't let me stop you from doing what you're doing. <laughs> you have hot coffee? Well, hot is relative. It's warmer than what I would like to <clears throat> expose my mucous membranes to, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anything new you want to share? Probably doing some jujitsu today with Nelson Puentes, the uh, founder of Inverted Gear. So I'm oh. hoping that that happens later today. He's in Reno. He's in Reno. He didn't tell me that. He That's just exciting. pinged me yesterday. So we'll see how that goes. That's exciting. Yeah. So I get some some Puentes smashitude today, hopefully. <laughs> All right. Shall we jump into our questions? Well, let's wade into them. Let's let's take our take our time and go go safely. Slowly. Yeah. Okay. Well, this first one is uh, on baby led weaning from Rory, and he says, "We follow Chris Kresser's healthy baby code when introducing foods to our children, starting with purees and graduating to solid foods over time." Uh, she's recently learned of baby led weaning. Completely unscientific aside, anything that starts with baby led can't be a good idea, like baby led bedtime or baby led TV watching. Dude, baby led bedtime is definitely not a good idea. <laughs> Toddler led bedtime and uh, seven year old led bedtime is also not a good idea. Um, the theory, as I understand it, is that you present your kid with chunks of various foods and let them choose what to eat based on their tastes, rather than forcing a puree of some kind that may or that they may not prefer if they weren't being fed by you. Your thoughts? I know your kids are obviously paleo, and we're curious how you navigated the introduction of foods and respect for their preferences as their tastes develop. We had no respect for them. We just forced food on them and told them, this is a hard life, kids. The sooner you learn that, the better. <laughs> or not really. So we, I, I, did, I did two blog posts on feeding kids paleo. So we should definitely link to those. Um, they're old now, but I mean, everybody else's kids go Our through kids the same. <laughs> yeah, it, it, you know, they go through these cycles and... Uh, I, I guess the tough, the, so we, I mean, so, some of the baby led stuff, I mean, Zoe and would, loved liver, like we'd cook a piece of like beef liver or chicken liver and she would just hold it and suck on it, bacon, um, apples, the, for, for, for me, and I don't know if this is just like a paranoid mom thing, but the choking thing was, was and Zoe in particular, like we did the finger sweep of her throat probably well even when she was three maybe four we were traveling we were in a whole foods doing like the food yeah. bar and i had to get up and do the like yeah we back strike she, was, a, she yeah. was our one that was prone to gagging and choking on food because she has a tendency of only chewing her food like twice might be a genetic predilection there and then she tries to swallow it whole she does take after me <laughs> <laughs> um Readers of the Paleo Solution might, re might recognize recall. a reference. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, we did that stuff, but we also... So, this is one of the things... So, for the little, little ones, when they're just transitioning, what was really interesting, and we had a, a fair amount of pushback around this, even from our good friend Eva T., but I, I think she was kind of misguided on that. Um, we would puree a food and the kids were totally ho-hum about it. But if we just chewed it a little bit and then like mm -hmm. took it and slapped it in their mouth, they ate it. Mm -hmm. Like they, it was. Because they're fixated on what you're eating. And if, and if you give them, you know, it was mainly meat that we did that with. Yeah. 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 So that was, that was interesting. And if you think about the whole gut microbiome thing and all that stuff, like it, it's kind of an in intriguing story like when you look at uh the way that traditional cultures deal with a lot of the processes that, that we uh, see as being unsanitary and, and maybe this is why a lot of people die <laughs> young due to you know infectious disease but I, I think that there's some upsides too so um are we actually answering this question i mean we're kind of bouncing okay so around. how did we navigate the introduction of foods and respect for their some of it was chewing yeah, we, we offered and... them things and like avocado, sweet potato. They both really like sweet potato early on, both the like orange yam ones, the purple kind of Hawaiian. Or, yeah, yeah, uh, the purple sweet. sweet and that was a funny thing loved. too. Both of them loved all that stuff earlier. And I don't know if we burned them out or what, but now they don't they really don't, eat yeah. it that well. Yeah. Um, um, and if they didn't like it, we, we would uh, 
put it back in the rotation it, maybe six wait, months later. Yeah, we'd wait a little while and then and then offer it to them again. What was that deal like? We we entered. Neither one of our kids did the projectile vomiting of eggs. But yeah. the, like the egg yolk was the thing to introduce to the kids, but we actually punted that because everything we read there seemed like 50% of the kids yeah. projectile vomited that, but we didn't have a problem with that. Um, one problem we've had is fruit, even to this day, mm-hmm. where it, particularly summertime rolls around. and So we know, would get a rash from pineapple. She would just like, she loved pineapple. She'd eat a ton of it. This was just like 11 months old, 12 yeah. months old. And then she had a rash all over her legs. So yeah. we had to cut back the pineapple. Well, and they will get the trots too. Like yeah. they'll eat fruit until they're shitting like geese. Yeah. So it's, it's uh, and it's tough because it gets hot and you want something simple and mm-hmm. you don't want to arm wrestle they with like them it. over everything <laughs> and they like it. So it's like, oh man, you just keep on, you know, chopping off logs of watermelon or apples. Like both, mm-hmm. we've noticed apples are kind of rough yeah, on both kids. If they eat too many apples, they'll, they'll both complain that their stomach hurts. So. Yeah. Um... But again, I feel like we're kind of bouncing around this thing. Yeah, uh, we didn't do the baby, like the baby led weaning, at least as I understand it, it's like you're putting whole pieces of stuff out there and then they're tasting it and just going to what they gravitate towards. Um, we sort of, whatever we cooked, we, you know, gave them some version of that, whether it was sweet potato, pieces of cooked broccoli, um, fruit, uh, you know, meat, like you said, chewed it, chewed it first. And there were things that they clearly spit out and didn't like, and we just waited and tried it again. Yeah. It is interesting, though, when you look at the detox pathways in children. Like, it, 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 kids seem to have a more attuned sense for like bitter tastes, which it, it mainly comes from plants. So, even to the degree that they ate greens, um, it was just like the very greeniest tip top yeah. of Broccoli, the broccoli. Just the tip. Yeah. Like the. It, the the leafy part. The, the very the, end the, of the, the floret. Yeah. 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 So like when you think about a nutrient density kind of story, like they smashed meat, they really went after liver. Um, Sagan liked butter a lot. Mm-hmm. Zoe not so much, mm-hmm. which was interesting. I mean, Sagan would ask for just a Peace slice butter. of butter to eat. Um, but they definitely, it, it makes a ton of sense to me that the kids are gravitating towards these more nutrient dense foods. Um, we figured out with like salads, we don't do a ton of salads. We do some salad, but we figured out like three different dressings. You do a, a apple cider vinegar, olive oil, olive oil, one clove of garlic, and a lot of salt. And then puree and, that and put yeah. it on the but salad. That's now, and they're almost five and seven. So right, but they wouldn't eat that stuff right. at all without that. But even to the degree they eat that, you put that dressing on ahead of time, and it almost kind of breaks mm-hmm. stuff down because the acid load. So it's interesting. Like I think that there's some pretty. Um, I think people get overly concerned about getting greens into their kids. Like mm-hmm. it, it'll happen when it when it's supposed to happen. They're not. It, if you get sufficient animal products in them, they're not going to be nutrient deficient. Right. And, and we made a lot of soups. We always we did we make a lot, do a lot of soups, soups. especially in the yeah. winter. And so we would just puree that and they would, they would eat that. And uh, one side note, I remember reading about this stuff. Like if you want your kids to eat things better and it's kind of a pain in the ass, but if you cut things smaller, the kids will tend to eat more and not surprisingly, this is also one of the things that we makes things see more hyper palatable makes it more hyper palatable. So when, when people tend to overeat, it, it's when things are super cut up and, and well processed and everything. But again, I think that there's some interesting kind of evolutionary biology on just observing how kids eat. Like they tend to gravitate towards nutrient dense foods. They seem to have a real um, aversion towards things that could potentially be toxic you know, mainly like bitter type substances and stuff like that. Um, what else? What else? Uh, you definitely see the the dangers of hyper palatable foods real quickly with kids. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. And man, that was all over the place for an otherwise like simple question. But it's I mean, because there's a lot our, we on. had our first kid seven years ago, and so the sleep deprivation that and has ensued old. since then, like we we sleep. We should be having living. grandkids now instead of kids. So. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Rory. Let's see. Our next question is from Laura on a post-lunch coma on keto. Hi, Robin, Nikki. I have a question regarding an incessant post-lunch coma regardless of diet. I've experienced a mean bout of fatigue and extreme cold every day following lunch for much of my adult life. I've been in the paleo bandwagon on the paleo bandwagon for almost 10 years with marginal improvement in that area. And recently doing keto, I've experienced only a little bit of relief. 
I still get almost debilitatingly fatigued and cold after eating lunch. If I have a sweet potato or a piece of fruit with lunch, it's definitely a lot worse. But even with my typical lunch of leftover protein and veggies or a version of Mark Sisson's big ass salad, I experience a couple hours of wanting to get in bed after lunch. I follow the Keto Gains recommendations on electrolyte tracking and consumption mm-hmm. of electrolytes. For breakfast, I usually have some variation of three to four eggs. I'm 33 year, three years old, female, healthy weight, CrossFit two to three times a week. My recent lab work was excellent, low inflammatory markers, lipids and blood sugar markers all good. T3 was on the low end of normal, but all other thyroid measures um, within normal is that within limits. Normal limits? Yep. I am mindful of circadian rhythms and do all I can to optimize sleep. However, it isn't ideal as I have a toddler and a baby. I don't think they can totally be blamed for the issue though, as I have experienced this for many years. Thanks for your time and for the profound impact you've had on my life and the lives of many others. So I guess one question, so what would, when I was first reading through this, I was like electrolyte, elect, oh, okay, she's doing the electrolyte. So that was one thing that I was uh, thinking about. The other thing that I'm curious, does Laura experience this with breakfast or dinner? Or is this purely a lunch phenomenon? And well, she's, she's, I think she would say it if it was after every meal. She specifically says lunch. Lunch. Yeah, but you know how people are. Like, I'm sure Laura is super cracker jack, but she's like, oh, yeah, it does happen with, with breakfast and dinner. So, it, a couple of thoughts are like maybe a low stomach acid kind of scenario. Like, this thing is sounding almost more like a, a gut permeability, you know, like, um, histamine response like you know it, it's sounding like something other than just blood sugar specifically but we you know like if folks red wired to eat uh, you should recall that we have the blood sugar piece as a standalone of just like dietary carbohydrate but we also have the immunogenic potential of food and the bugger is that if we have i think it was last week we talked about like digestive enzymes and mm-hmm. and all that stuff potentially helping with with um food reactivity because if the food is super well digested and broken down because of adequate uh, acid load in the stomach and then uh, uh, digestive enzymes, then we have the appropriate things hitting the gut lining instead of intact proteins that can cause a response. So that would be some stuff I would tinker with like um, betaine hydrochloride capsules, uh, uh, apple cider vinegar capsules, maybe some sort of a a pancreatin uh, enzyme that you throw down with the meal. Um, also doing a 15 minute, 10 minute meditation post meal, I think could be huge. Um, any way that we can, um, get into that parasympathetic state and kind of activate the vagal nerve so that we're getting blood flow and innervation to the, to the GI tract. And so that we're, we're doing, we're in that digest and rest mode could actually be helpful it's interesting um when you're used to like you know stimulants and coffee and all that stuff that's one type of energy but being restful and and not stressed is interestingly and it's energetic too but it's very different than like you know right yeah yeah so the so i guess the the thoughts that i would have Try doing some sort of a, a meditation practice post lunch if you can, if you can fit that in. Even doing five minutes of well, like even the, not even post lunch, but if you got into a routine where you did it in the morning and in the afternoon, the morning sit might help with the post lunch yeah. fatigue. Yeah, because if she's already tired, I could see her starting to sit and just like nodding off. Nodding off could be could yeah. be, but I, I would definitely noodle on. Some sort of a meditation practice, getting plugged into that, and then additionally uh, the digestive support, and then beyond that, I got I got nothing beyond that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Let us know, Laura. Though, like if, if you try yeah. the digest- digestive support and it works, then let us know. If it doesn't work, then let us know, and maybe Rob will something do some else additional will noodling. Yeah, in his, in his mind. It, and you know, she she mentioned the T three was on the low end of normal. Um, it's really, really, this is kind of looking at cholesterol to some degree. The, the way that thyroid is generally assessed, they should be looking at T3, T4, reverse T3, thyroid uptake, uh, TSH. And you really need the whole picture that you're looking at with that. Plus, we still need to then just ask the question, okay, do we see any clinical signs of problems? And definitely... 
Thyroid is really important for basic me metabolic rate. The fact that she mentioned cold multiple right. times and she right. actually gets cold after a meal. If anything, Normally you should get, get warm after, a meal, after yeah. a meal. So so that thyroid piece is something that would be worth um, nosing around a little bit. Uh, if you if they didn't do the full thyroid the, package. Yeah, and, yeah, and virtually nobody does. Like, But if you do a little, little bit of Googling on... Uh, uh, functional medicine thyroid panel, then you'll see the full suite that you you should get on that. Chris Cresser has talked about it. Uh, Chris Master John's talked about it. I think that we've posted on that previously. But that's the only other thing that's kind of rattling back there is is potential low l legitimate low thyroid for you, even if you're within normal ranges. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Our next question is from Mehdi. He says, it's on balding. Um, he says, hello, what is your advice for a 28-year-old male having male pattern baldness? Is it really genetic destiny or is there any way of living, eating, exercising, sleeping, etc. that can help me keep my hair? Please help. I don't know where to turn. Do you guys recommend my, any good sources for male pattern baldness information? I read Mark Sisson's article and I don't think I suffer from any of the conditions he mentions. Yeah, it's interesting. So this is one of the, the things that we really don't see in pre-agricultural societies. Like this really, I think that there's a genetic predisposition here and it relates to the conversion of testosterone into a DHT, dihydrotestosterone. And this can kind of overwhelm the receptors and the, the hair follicles, particularly in this area. And um, that plus a, a kind of overly elevated insulin environment seems to be kind of the, the synergy that produces it. So a lower insulin load could be certainly helpful. And then there have been some products, I'm blanking, like the basic Rogaine type stuff where people will apply something to the scalp. Those things really work. They work uh, remarkably well for most people tend to have pretty minimal side effects because you're not taking these substances internally. You get some internal activity, but because it's topical, you don't, don't get as much. But the, the two thoughts are to look into uh, something like these Rogaine type products and then also um, making sure the insulin load is properly addressed. And then sleep and exercise and all the so other I, things that I help have, you. I have deal a friend who um, swears also by scalp massage and uh, handstands to increase the blood flow. I don't know if there's any science behind it. What um, friend is this? <laughs> it's uh, uh, you don't have to name the yeah, name, but uh, somebody that I see when I go to my Austin stuff. Okay. Okay. Um. So I don't know if if there's something to that, but. <laughs> worth a shot i'll put that one on the very much the anecdotal uh, <laughs> uh not a lot of but hey doing handstands is good handstands for are good for good you, for you so anyway yeah. and yeah. scalp massage feels good so there you go reduce yeah. cortisol and maybe everything works out so yeah anything else on that one no no, no. i don't want okay. to beat that one anymore okay, so. okay. All right, our next question is from kevin portion sizes like eddie the strong man Hi, can you give a little help in the way of portion sizes? I've been eating paleo, low carb, grain, dairy, legume free for about a year and I feel like I've just recently stopped craving sugar and it feels liberating. I'm extremely active due to my work. I'm 5'9", 145 pounds, lean male. In order to feel full, my meals, three or four a day, are absolutely giant. Usually I have focused on about eight to 10 ounces of protein per meal and fill the rest with giant vegetable portions. Recently, due to all that vegetable bloating the heck out of my belly, I have switched to more like 16 to 20 ounces of protein and a bit less veggies to cut down on the bloating. This feels better, but it seems like a ton, and I was wondering how this compares to others. Basically, for every meal recently, I throw 16 to 20 ounces of protein in a 10 and a half inch or 12 inch cast iron skillet, cook the protein with a fat, and then fill the pan to the top with veggies. I thoroughly enjoy this, but when I explain to some folks, I put down 16 or so ounces of beef, pork, fish, chicken, they look at me like I will have colon cancer within the calendar year. I admit I'm too darn active, but I have no choice due to work than play. Light details, but I work in the mountains above 8,000 feet and I'm self-powered everywhere I go with a large pack. Sleep is decent as I work emergency services and sometimes will be up all night working, but not the norm. I get tons of sun, weight is good I think, blood work appears good, 
Any suggestions on these portion sizes? I feel like I'm going to eat myself into bankruptcy, but need to feed the beast to keep my energy up. I tinker on off with safe starches, but I feel like these make me more hungry and I'm more satisfied with the higher protein. I've also played with carb night like refeeds per John Kiefer when I'm running a touch lightweight or low on energy, which gives me a bit of a recharge, but I'm still avoiding grains, dairy, and legumes during the refeed. I generally use fat for flavor per your suggestion, as if I go as if I go big on fat, it makes me kind of nauseous and I get less than ideal bowel movements. Although it has been a year on paleo, coming off of 15 years of vegetarianism, I feel like I have yet to find the optimal balance and I'm constantly tinkering. My body comp has changed drastically as I've noticed I now have muscles and carry about three to five extra pounds that I believe is muscle. Help me please, I very much enjoy your work. You are a good person. So I mean, the main question here is, you know, is he eating too much protein and is he gonna get the cancers from it and all that stuff? I did a, a talk on um, will low carb diets shorten your life, and as part of that, I, I dig into this thing called the Mid Victorian Diet, and it, it's really interesting because it looks at, at uh, people living in the UK, the Mid Victorian era, early eighteen hundreds. Food quality is pretty low, health is poor, as food distribution networks get better established and some improvements in animal husbandry and farming practices occur. Uh, people eat more fish, people eat a lot more protein from ruminants uh, in particular, and then more fruit. And not surprisingly, there's about an 80 year period there that this occurs and people get taller, they get healthier, their average lifespan is as good as what it is today, uh, arguably even better, and this is pre-antibiotics, pre-surgery, all this stuff. And then they start industrializing their food system and everybody gets like there's a six inches of height loss that lifespan plummets, at, uh, you know, and until the mid uh, uh, 1940, 1950, do we start seeing a food system that's able to feed people adequately to start undoing some of that stuff. So these folks were very, very active. The males on average ate about 4,500 to 5,000 calories a day. They had an activity level that supported that. The women were very, very active too. Um, similar caloric intake, just smaller body frame. And these people were not succumbing to the diseases of West, you know, Western degenerative disease because they ate a largely whole unprocessed diet. They got adequate protein, mm -hmm. which was quite a lot of protein. At least a gram of protein per pound of body weight was kind of the, the norm for these folks and um, good nutrient density. So on the one hand, I, I just, there's nothing compelling about this that, that has me worried about the cancer and uh, you know uh, what is it from deadpool l cancer how, how do you say cancer in yeah. spanish l cancer um so it like I, i'm just not you know it, and then part of the question too is like okay what else are you gonna do you've tinkered with eating more starchy type things and you don't feel as good and you actually get more hungry which is kind of the thing that i've experienced and is this kind of roller coaster I'm always on uh, and it was kind of the magic of the first time I went low carb I wasn't always hungry and I know that for some people like if you get real geeked out on the endocrinology um, insulin should be anorexigenic it should make you full and I think in normal people like normal human physiology that should be true but not that many of us are normal like there's different elements that got dysbiosis, different different elements have kind of broken that. And so I, I, it, it sounds like what, what Kevin is doing is working. Um, I appreciate that it's probably not the cheapest way to eat, but you're also investing in your health and your long-term physicality. So I, it, it and he's so incredibly active. Like if his activity level dropped, you know, but it sounds like I can't because that's his, his work. Right. He probably would drop. Right. Drop that. And again, you know, like uh, uh, I, I've experienced the same thing where if I add too much outside fat, I get the trots also. Um, digestive support helps that for sure. Betaine hydrochloride, the uh, uh, apple cider vinegar caps. Um, it, it sounds like just fat absorption may be a real issue. So doing something like ox bile, which helps you to emulsify and, and absorb those fats. And then tinkering with... You know, like I noticed that starches, I don't do that, that well with like, I, it, eh, so, so, but real small amounts, but like berries and melons, if it, to the degree I can tolerate things, berries, melons, 
mangoes, papaya, oddly enough, the high glycemic load tropical fruits actually do comparatively okay on. It tends to not give me massive GI problems, and I tend to not have as much of the, the blood sugar highs and lows to the degree that I, I stick those in the rotation. Hmm. Okay. Let's see, our last question is on creatine and cold sores. This question is from Chris. Hey Robin, Nikki, I'm a longtime listener and a fan of both formats, but super glad that you guys decided to bring back the Q&As. Each week I look forward to listening to your Jedi-like paleo wisdom. But enough about you, let's talk about me. Indeed. <laughs> the vein of my existence since my late teens, the vein, the vein of my existence. Should be vein. Yeah. yeah. Since my late teens has been the occasional cold sore. I've been paleo cyclic ketogenic for about four years now, which has decreased the occurrence from about four to five times a year to only once or twice a year. Still, I absolutely dread the day that one of those little suckers shows up, and I do everything in my power to prevent that from happening. Since arginine seems to be an antagonist to the virus, I do my best to avoid it at all costs and supplement with L-lysine as well. This brings me to my question, which pertains to creatine. I have been thinking about starting to supplement with creatine, but when doing research, I realized that it's actually made up of the three specific amino acids, methionine, glycine, and yep, arginine. Now I'm worried that supplementing with creatine will cause a dreaded outbreak. Is this accurate or am I overanalyzing? Would supplementing with lysine at the same time prevent arginine dominance in the cells or is that nonsense? Any other tips on prevention? I've scoured the interwebs for an answer to no avail and would truly appreciate your input, Paleo Juan Kenobi. Thank you for what you do and keep up the good work. So I, I'm just I'm perplexed by this. Uh, I, I'm i not... Do you want to do a little Google searching here, Google wife? Yep. Uh, creatine structure? Like, I, it doesn't make sense to me that creatine is made up of those... Um, yeah, uh, like, uh, yeah, creatine structure, yeah, because it's a fairly simple, it's all the phosphate back, backbone, um, or it's the backbone to attach phosphates. Like, I don't, I don't get where, where the notion that creatine is containing arginine and this other, well, arginine in, in, in particular. So I don't think that that's an issue at all, uh, one. He's doing great management uh, using the lysine. You can use lysine, both uh, topical creams. The, uh, I'm blanking on the name of the outfit, but they have a lysine cream that you can use. And then just taking lysine prophylactically you know, with meals is a great idea. I don't think that the arginine is going to be a, a remotely an issue in the case with um, uh, creatine because it, that, that it, maybe he's looked at some formulas that have these other... Um, uh, amino acids in the mix, but that gotcha. is not the backbone of creatine. Gotcha. So, yeah. Do cold sores happen when you're more run down? Like, is they that absolutely that, like, do. when you're kind of yep. like, yep. they you know, absolutely digging, do. Digging. So maybe it's like trying to manage clearly sleep and all these other lifestyle factors to keep, keep you more. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the more immunocompromised you are, the more likely you are. It, and it's one of those signs of things kind of going sideways. Uh, arginine can definitely be a growth promoter, whereas lysine tends to be a growth inhibitor on the, the uh, cold sore viruses. This is not, but to your point, um, it's similar to folks that um, they get shingles occasionally. You know, like somebody will get super run down, they get mono, and then on the tail end of mono, they end up with shingles because they're very immune compromised and, and these viruses can sense when the immune system is somewhat compromised and they will uh, ramp up uh, viral replication because they've got a little window of opportunity. Might be interesting, Chris, if you kind of pay attention the next time you get them, get one, like what were the two weeks leading up to that looking like? Were you super mm -hmm. stressed and have like tons of, you know, kind of, you know, stuff going on in your life? And then, and then at least you have that baseline. That baseline. Yeah. And, and then if you feel yourself kind of going into to a mode like that, you can kind of try to take a step back if it's possible for sure and yeah do some self-care and yeah but it, as far as the baseline like i don't see unless i'm totally failing my if i need my biochemist card revoked i i don't see how arginine is a, a player in the structure of creatine so yeah okay i think that was our last question for the week. cool okay cool, anything guys. else 
I don't think so. We're trying to uh, trying to bank some, some of these, of these up um, just because summer is coming. <laughs> Believe it or not, and our kids are going to be out of school, so it's yeah, like Game of Thrones. It, winter, yeah, is winter is coming, and, and us, chaos ensues. Summer is coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we want to try to make sure we don't leave you guys high and dry over the summer. So we're gonna, and it definitely will be a little more challenging with the kids home. Yep, and we're gonna be moving. We're so, be moving. so we will be attempting to bank these, but keep sending in. Questions, mm-hmm. we will get to those. Yep. And you can submit those at the contact page on rubwolf.com. And, and most of the activity I'm doing online currently is um, at Das Rob Wolf on Instagram. We have some interesting stuff cooking, though. Yep. We'll, we'll let we're you guys know about that more as, we, as that rolls out. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yep. And as always, our show sponsor this week is Drink Element. All of your electrolyte needs with none of the dodgy stuff. Oh, and, and to that point, uh, I just saw it this morning, literally haven't even read the paper yet, but the, the uh, I guess the headline with the actual scientific paper is, are you consuming, uh, how much sodium are you consuming, dot, 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 probably not enough. And just in the very quick glance that I looked at on that, it said that folks should be hitting at least three to five grams of sodium per day. Mm -hmm. There's probably some outliers, some exceptions uh, around there, but this squares up very nicely with what we saw from the um, type 2 diabetic heart patients and the U-curve in that population uh, with the low ebb of morbidity mortality being at five grams of, of intake per day. So... We're not crazy recommend mm-hmm. apparently um, recommending uh, supplemental sodium and and from the results that people have been getting it seems like it's working pretty well for people mm-hmm. cool cool all right guys see you next time